This is the sixth in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In the last lecture, we looked at vectors on manifolds, tangent vectors. In this lecture, we're going to think about vector fields, a smoothly varying family of vectors, one at each point of a manifold. Before we start thinking about vector fields, let's think first about some notation. We'll start with a little bit of Einstein's notation. Instead of writing um, the coordinates of a point in Rn as having x be x1 dot 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 xn, so these are the coordinates of the point, or coordinate functions of a, of a point in a manifold, um, we'll write them using superscripts instead of subscripts. So we'll write the point as having um, components, uh, coordinates, x1 to xn. These are superscripts now instead of subscripts. This um, is standard uh, due to Einstein, and it's uh, so it's unavoidable. We sort of have to use this notation, and it's good to get familiar with it, even if you don't like it. But it does have a dis certain disadvantage. It's very hard to get used to writing x squared to mean the second component of the vector x, and not to mean the square of something. x two upper two no longer means x squared in Einstein notation. Similarly, we'll write every vector as having uh, components uh, v1 to vn. Or, if you like, we often write them, we we'll usually write our vectors as uh, columns v1 to vn. Um, so that gives us uh, some of the notation we want to think about. The next issue we want to think about is um, is uh, how we how we talk about functions uh, when we do, when we carry out scientific experiments. We measure quantities. Different people measure them, as we said before, differently using different coordinates. Um, let's just think about about uh, polar coordinates. So, as an example, think about polar coordinates because that's an example we've already seen many times in several variable calculus. So it's not quite as confusing as the abstract notion of manifold. I want to imagine that there's an actual geometric object, a plane, out there somewhere, an infinite plane, and that we describe it. Some scientist decides to measure where things are in that plane by picking an origin and computing out locations of points on that plane using a copy of the plane and computing out r's and uh, thetas, uh, some polar coordinates. But some other scientist uses the same origin but decides to measure things out in x's and y's. Okay, so this is somehow the geometric plane. This is the manifold itself. And this is the the a chart, and this is the other chart. And there's, of course, a transition map between them in our fancy language that we have now of manifolds. So I want to think of this as the abstract geometric actual plane. And these are the different ways we, we measure the plane. Now, when we worked with polar coordinates in several variable calculus, we thought about a function, for example, let's take the function x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus 2x squared y squared. And we said one of the nice things about polar coordinates is that if you plug that, you take this complicated function, it might turn out to be simpler in polar coordinates. In fact, it turns out to be just r to the fourth. But what do I mean by that? Uh, as a mathematician, I'm uncomfortable with that because this h is a function of x and y. So it's a function on this plane. And this h is a function of r, so it's a function on this plane. So these are two different expressions that are functions on two different planes. What I mean by saying that they're equal is that if you calculate the function of x, y here, and then you figure out which point it corresponds to in the actual geometric plane, and then you calculate its r theta values, then you get this. So these are really two different functions, but it's understood that we use the transition map to relate them one to the other. And that's something we've always done in polar coordinates without mentioning it. We always use the same letter h for some expression as expressed in x's and y's and in r's and theta's. And we always understood what we meant when we were switching back and forth between one set of variables and the other. And we always use the same letter h, whether it was thought of as being a function in this geometric plane or a function of x and y variables or a function of r and theta variables. So we've never been afraid to uh, to deal with a function by uh, by switching back and forth w w without even mentioning it and identifying these planes, all three of them, 
uh, and then switching back and forth between functions of different variables, calling them all by the same letter H. So we want to do the same thing on manifolds. So if on a manifold, on an abstract manifold, not on the plane, but on an abstract manifold M, if we had a function H, um, now our, in, in an abstract manifold, of course, we don't expect that the whole manifold is covered by one chart. We expect we have a chart on a little chunk of it, um, and we then make that chunk into a piece of the flat plane. And then we might have, someone else might have another chart um, on another piece of it, um, so uh, maybe overlapping, possibly, and making that into another piece of the flat plane, or and whatever many variables there are in our whatever dimension we're working in. Um, so this is some other chart. And then um, when we have this situation, we, we usually give these coordinates names. So this is x1, x2. Note I'm using Einstein notation, so I'm using upper sub subscripts, uh, superscripts. Um, so, and these would be some y variables. Now we have a function. So the function is h. The function is defined here. It associates to every point of this guy some some number. Think of it as a temperature. Think of this as being made out of metal, and it has different temperatures at different points, and that temperature is maybe given by some quantity h. Um, we calculate that the, the expression of that temperature in the x variables by using this, and the temperature expression in the y variables by using this chart. And so we give rise to functions of the x variables by h composed phi inverse, so phi inverse goes back, we take our x variable, we calculate backwards onto the abstract manifold, and then we calculate the value of the temperature at that point in the manifold. And that guy, therefore, is a function of x1 and x2. And this uh, expression over here, then, in, in terms of y variables, the other scientist who prefers to use uh, y1 and y2 variables is going to be calculating um, going backwards by this map C, and then calculating the value of temperature at some corresponding point here using these variables. And of course, these have to be matched up by the transition map. But um, naturally, just as we did in polar coordinates, the, this function will be uh, always called, uh, uh, called H as well. And this one will also be called H, which is confusing because they're not the same function. Um, but this one will be called h of x1, x2, and this will be called h of y1, y2, and so on if there are more than two. I gave an example here of a surface, but if it had um, set more than more than two y variables or more than two x variables, we'd put them in as well. So the, the, the name h, little h, will be used for a function of these variables, for a function on the abstract manifold, and for a function of these variables, and there'll be different functions. All we have uh, to, to relate them is that this one and this one are related by the transition map. So the h of the y's, if you like, is uh, equal to h of y of x's for the transition map. Um, so that's the notation that we'll use. And it's, as, just as I said before, this is exactly what we always did in polar coordinates. You could work in polar coordinates and rectangular coordinates, and you still call the function h, even though it was expressed as a different thing in the different coordinate systems. Um, and it was convenient to do that, to always use the same letter h. So we'll do that with manifolds as well. And if we have maps between manifolds, we'll do a similar thing, almost exactly the same thing. Suppose we have two manifolds. Um, some p and some uh, q, and we have a map, let's call it capital F, between them, then we could take a chart. Now we're going to need charts on both of them. So we'll have a chart on this guy, call it phi, which is going to turn a chunk of that manifold into some chunk of a very concrete Euclidean space. And then over in this one, not on the same manifold, on the other manifold, we have a different chart. Let's call it, for lack of letters, uh, let's call it C. And it maps to some chunk also of some Euclidean space. And these could be different dimensional manifolds. This one could have dimension 100. And this one could have dimension 7. That's fine. Uh, they could be different dimensional manifolds. And then this, this would be 100 dimensional or, or uh, Euclidean space. And this would be Euclidean space dimension 7, for example. OK, so then there has to be a map that goes between these two. It's not a transition map anymore. The map that takes a point here and then goes back up, along, and down. Yeah, it can be thought of as something like a transition map. So there's a map between these variables, which is exactly given by, if I want to go from green 
uh, phi coordinates, these variables here, I want to go over these ones, what I do is I calculate which point this corresponds to. So I take a point here, figure out which point it corresponds to by using phi inverse, then use f to get over to a point here, and then use c to get down to a point here. And so this mapping is, of course, phi inverse, followed by capital F, followed by c. So that's the map. And that map expresses in actual variables. These may be called, say, x variables. And as often we, as we've always done, these will be some y variables. They might be different numbers of variables, though. Uh, there are as many y variables here as there are dimensions of q. There's many x variables here as there are dimensions of p. Right? So this is a chart for p. This is a chart for q. They're different manifolds of very different dimensions, perhaps. So this has the same number of dimensions as p does. This has the same number of dimensions as q does. And this map is a map that may be mapping many, mapping 100 variables here to 7 variables here. Now, this map will then, of course, have some inputs, which are x's. And it will have some outputs, which are y's. And so it will be written as y is something of x. Well, it literally should be written as y is psi of f of f inverse of x. Phi phi of e inverse of x. And that's how it should be written. But of course, we'll always write it in the incorrect but helpful notation y is f of x. Because we'll think of this as the map capital F expressed in these variables. So we have an abstract manifold, we have an abstract map of manifolds. But when we have to write it down explicitly in variables, we have to take some variables that represent a chunk of this manifold here, and then some variables representing a chunk of that manifold there. And the map has to be expressed as a map from variables to variables. And it's a smooth map of those variables. So it has to be possible to somehow write it like this. And so rather than writing it in the rigorous correct notation as, as, um, as uh, psi of f of phi inverse of x, we'll just always call it y is capital F of x. That isn't uh, a very precise, very careful notation because, of course, you could change the charts and you change what this capital F is in an expression in charts if you change the charts. But you won't change what the actual map is on the manifolds and the abstract manifolds. Further notation, so, so far just we've only talked about notation and we're still talking only about notation. I want to think about um, what's called Einstein's summation notation, which takes us one more step, well, the final step, really, into the world of Einstein's um, notation, uh, as far as we're going to go, um, into using Einstein's style of notation. And this is um, simply the convention that um, often we find sums that have a particular form to them. And so we're going to drop summation signs when we encounter them. Whenever we see an expression that has some expression A that somewhere in involves an index, it could have many indices, but one of them is some index I. I have another expression multiplied by it, which has maybe many, many indices, but one of them is also called I. They have the same name. This I is, is written as a subscript, and this one is a superscript. This always means... It doesn't mean that I is a fix that a fixed at a particular value. It always means the sum over I of a i b i. So if I write an expression with a lower and an upper subscript, but they're the same letter, that means that implicitly I'm summing over i. And what do I mean summing over i? Which values of i do I sum over? Well, just all the values for which the expression makes sense. So it's a convenient notation to have. Um, it turns out it gets rid of a lot of summation signs. It's not enormously convenient. I'd be just as happy without it. But it's become so standard in the literature um, so that it's uh, it's unavoidable, so it's best to learn it. And so we'll try and use Einstein's summation notation. We'll see some examples of it in a minute. We're finally ready to start thinking about what are vector fields. Vector fields on manifolds should obviously associate to each point a vector. So a vector field x on a manifold M is a map that takes any point in M and maps to it a vector, x of M, but it happens to be in the tangent space at M. The picture we have in mind is, of course, that our manifold is some kind of nice smooth thing and that our vector field is associating to it a little uh, velocity at each point, which we could imagine as the velocity of a fluid that fills up the entire manifold, 
And um, so it's defined at every point, this flow of this fluid, this little vector. The vector could be zero. There can be points where the vector is allowed to be, say, zero vector. That's allowed too. Um, but there's supposed to be a vector at every single point of the manifold. Now, um, if you have such an object and you have a chart, then you can try and look at what it looks like in the chart. So, um, so suppose we have a vector field, um, call it x, on a manifold. And then if we have a chart, the chart's not defined everywhere. Of course, it's only defined on some open set u. But then we can associate to any um, point x, uh, to any vector x of m, this is some tangent vector at some point m. Uh, so if m it happens to lie inside that open set u, then we can um, simply uh, calculate out what is its representative. Uh, it has a, it has a, this is a tangent vector, so it has a tangent vector representative. Uh, it has to have some tangent vector representative, which is some phi v, where v is a normal ordinary vector in Rn, and and phi is our chart. And we know how to transform from one to the other by our rule that we multiply by the derivative of the transition map if you change the choice of the chart phi. Um, so let's write this v not as little vector v, which is how we wrote it previously, but now we'll write it as capital X at the point x, um, where the point x here, little x, is phi of the point m. So that means that I have uh, an abstract manifold m, and at each point, uh, say m, I have a vector x of m, and then I have a chart um, defined in here, which uh, takes me to some region in Euclidean space. At the corresponding point, little x, which is the corresponding point to m, little x is phi of m, over here, I have a vector, a tangent vector representative. Okay, so this the representative um, is given by some, the choice of the phi, uh, the chart, and then a particular vector x, a little x. And just as we did before, when we talked about functions, we allowed ourselves the freedom to use the same letter for the function in the chart as we did for the function on the manifold. And we're doing that here too. Capital X here is supposed to associate to each point of the manifold, and little m, a vector, uh, a tangent vector. But the representative of that in this chart should be should be this vector here. Okay, so that expression defines for us a, a quantity a capital X of little x, and of course we want to say that x is said capital X is said to be smooth uh, if um, capital X of m, the vector field on the manifold on m, is smooth if this capital X of little x is smooth if for all charts for any chart. So what we end up with is a, this is a vector field in Euclidean space. This is not a scary object. It's just a capital X of little x. It's a vector in Euclidean space, an ordinary vector, a column of numbers. And we write our columns of numbers with superscripts because we're following Einstein. So it looks like this, x2 of little x dot dot dot, xn of little x. To say that it's smooth just means that these are smooth functions. Smooth functions. So if, if somehow this x, where this x, as we've described it, is just some arbitrary association of a vector to each point, but when we take the tangent vector representative of that in a chart, we get a tangent vector in that chart, um, that would have to then be, to be smooth, we'd have to have that, those all be smooth functions. These are just ordinary smooth functions of x, of little x variables. So capital X of little x is an ordinary uh, Euclidean vector in valued Euclidean space um, in Rn, and, uh, but these, these quantities are actually functions of these x variables, little x variables. Now if we have uh, a map, we said what we could do with maps and vectors, we had we had a map f takes p to q of manifolds, and we had a vector in a tangent space at, uh, tangent space at p, let's call it tpp. Um, we could map it to a vector f prime at p um, v. It was in tqq, where q is f of p. So we can map a vector in this guy to a vector in that guy by 
by the matrix of uh, the derivative matrix, so to speak. In the chart, it'll be an actual matrix. Uh, in the abstract theory, this is actually a, a linear transformation of abstract vector spaces. This is an abstract vector space, the tangent space at this point, and the tangent space at that point, another abstract vector space. But I'll think of this often as a matrix because it is when we write it out in a chart. So. Um, so that means that if we had, if, uh, if f, just to make it simpler, is a diffeomorphism, so it'll actually have an inverse, then um, we're going to define a, a, for each vector field, x on p, a vector field, we're going to define a vector field which is called f star x on q, the corresponding vector field. Because if they're diffeomorphic manifolds, they're exactly identified, then anything that lives here should be identified with something that lives here and vice versa. It should be possible to match up objects exactly. So if we have a vector field here, there should be a corresponding one here. That's the one that corresponds when you write everything out in charts. And what would its definition be? Simply that f star x at a point q, the corresponding vector field at the corresponding point, should be equal to the original vector field at the original point multiplied by the... Um, by the applied to, sorry, uh, applied in, plugged into the linear transformation. Um, which is uh, which takes vectors at that point to vectors at that point where q is f of p and that'll define for us the corresponding vector field on, on q a word about vector fields in charts um, so we're not very frightened of them so far we basically said that the vector field just means we write down a vector field in a chart we cover our manifold in charts and write down vector fields in them but we have to worry about of course that they match up when we change charts from one to the other um, but our notation begins to be a bit strange in this situation because if we think about how charts and vector fields interact, um, there's something odd about this. We have an abstract manifold M. Um, and we have, again, a chart that's going to carry us over here to some variables in Euclidean space, um, Xs. Uh, little x variable, these should be little Xs. It's hard to distinguish little ones from big ones. Um, so we have some little var some X variables. And then we can try to uh, take a different chart and compute out in some other, some y variables, so some overlapping region. And we map by some other chart, c, to some region in Euclidean space. And again, some, some uh, variables, which we're most often going to call, just to have a different name for them, call them y's. Okay, so if we have arbitrary charts, we can do this sort of thing. Now, what we said was that we had a, if we had a vector field x, so every point has a vector uh, coming out of it, there'll be a corresponding vector field in the chart. And that'll just be a rather boring uh, vector field, the usual sense of, of several variable calculus. It'll just have its vectors will actually be elements of Rn. Um, and that's called, uh, so this is the vector field capital X on the manifold. At each point M on the manifold, we have a vector capital X. This is the vector field, which we've called capital X of little x. And this has to therefore be, we have a corresponding guy over here, well, it has to be, there's nothing else for it to be, called uh, capital X of little y. This is for getting more dangerous, because before we were talking about saying that we'd use the same letter for a function, whether the function is defined in the actual manifold, or the same corresponding function mapped uh, map to, to it in the, in the charts, that's identified with that function by the charts. So that was fine for functions. Now we're doing it with vector fields. There's something a little bit more disturbing about that, because the, uh, the function... Uh, functions ma were matched up by matching up the points, but the vector fields are matched up by something a little bit more complicated. Of course, the something that matches them up is the derivative of the transition map. So we know that when you change from x variables to y variables, there's a transition map y is y of x, which is, of course, simply given by reversing the chart, phi, and then going forward on the chart, c, and applying that to the x uh, coordinates of some point in the x variables. But um, but we know how vectors should be related to vectors. We know, therefore, the, the vector here that corresponds to a vector here has to be given by the derivative of the transition map. So we need y prime of x applied to this uh, vector function. This is really just an ordinary Euclidean space vector, so it's just a column of numbers. Um, we have this matrix multiplied by this column of numbers, and it gives us this column of numbers. That looks a little bit weird, where this y in, in this expression here is supposed to be uh, y of x, our transition map. Now that looks a little strange, 
because I've used the symbol capital X here for something and symbol capital X here for something, but they're not the same something, and they're related by a complicated change of variables that not only involves switching X to Y variables, but also involves multiplying by some invertible matrix. So we should be a little bit more nervous about this process of using the same, this business of using the same symbol capital X for all these different things, because uh, you could change variables in very, very strange and complicated ways, but it does fit how real science is actually done. If you find the velocity of some moving fluid, some steady fluid flow, uh, and you calculate it in the variables the, that you measure, uh, used to, to measure the, where things are in, in, in a riverbed, and I use different variables, then they have to be related by some transformation, something exactly like this. And this has to be what we really do when we try and figure out how the velocity of the, of the, of the fluid as measured in your coordinates and your variables relates to mine. This has to be exactly what we do physically anyway. So it shouldn't be too frightening to consider that these are the same quantity but measured in different coordinates, different variables. So if we want to come up with examples of vector fields, we'd really like to be able to somehow write them down on non-trivial manifolds. Of course, Euclidean space, we have the vector fields, which are just the usual notions of vectors that you've seen in several variable calculus. But let's take a, an example where we can get a, a topologically intriguing manifold. Remember the Klein bottle is... Um, is the, the plane quotiented by certain certain group of transformations, gamma generated by two transformations, let's call them, say, alpha of xy is xy plus 1, the boring shift of the y variable by 1, and then beta, the more complicated transformation, which is going to move the x variable by 1 and then change the sign of the y variable. And the point of those was that it glued together uh, well, as we saw, I glued together the Klein bottle out of the out of a one by one square, so uh, from the plane. Now, small enough pieces of the plane project by local diffeomorphism, as we saw down to the the Klein bottle. So, if I can find a vector field on the plane, then locally, little chunks of the plane are identified with little chunks of of, of Klein bottle, little open sets, and that vector field then in the, each of those little tiny little open sets gets identified with the vector field down here on the corresponding tiny open set. But what if I change the choice? If I change the choice by an alpha or a beta, as long as the vector field is invariant under those, that will be well-defined. It'll give a well-defined vector field. So if I, globally, if I have a global vector field in the whole plane, alpha and beta invariant vector field, then it will, then it will descend. Conversely, every vector field down here must lift up here by the local diffeomorphism. The fact that a local diffeomorphism means we can locally identify them, and so we can pull back vector fields from here to here by the local identifications. We get a globally defined vector field on, on the plane, but it must also be, of course, alpha and beta invariant. So let's see what that looks like. We get, um, uh, let's, let's, well, let's just do an, one example. Consider the vector field x of little x and y on the plane which is just 1, 0. So now I want to show that that vector field is actually going to descend down to live on the Klein bottle. So that goes down. And, uh, and we'll show also that the following vector field, the other standard basis vector field, does not go down to the Klein bottle. Let's see how do we see that. How do we check it? So we have to calculate out derivatives. First of all, that alpha prime at any point x and y is just a linear map. So well, its derivative is just the identity map the identity linear map, and then beta prime, so again, there's a matrix of partial derivatives, right, of the output variables with regard to the input variables. So then beta prime is the matrix of first derivatives of these output variables with regard to these input variables, and so it's 1, 0, 0, minus 1. They're constant linear maps. So now we have to check and see that this guy is invariant under these transformations, this one's not. Let's check it. Um, so We'll check it by saying, well, if we had this transformation alpha, we'd want to check that alpha star x would become x, and that uh, beta star x would become x. And we want to check that one of those doesn't hold for, for, the, for the y. Let's check it. What does that mean? So we said that what you do when you do a diffeomorphism is alpha star x at any point x and y should be given by taking the corresponding point that you get by going backwards through alpha, alpha inverse of x, y, the point that x, y came from under alpha, calculating out alpha prime at that point, and then pushing forward the vector field, but calculated at that backward point. That's the 
the definition of this push forward. A push forward at a point is given by going to the point it came from on under alpha, calculating out the the derivative of alpha to push forward the vector that it that 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 came about at that point. So we take the point where we came from, alpha inverse of xy, calculate x there, put it through the derivative of the of the map alpha, and that should be the corresponding vector. That was our definition of pushing forward a vector field, this uh, little lower star operation on a vector field. So let's just calculate that out. That's the identity map, and this x at any point is 1, 0, and so we just get 1, 0, um, which is x. And so that did, in fact, turn out to be invariant. Beta star x of xy is beta prime at beta inverse of xy, x at beta inverse of xy. So to figure out what is beta inverse and what is beta prime. Now, beta prime was always at any point, always the same matrix. So we don't have to worry about that. This is more complicated, but then x at any point is always 1, 0. So we don't have to work that out either. Um, so we don't ever have to calculate in this example the beta inverse. And if we calculate this out, we get 1, 0, which is x. And so it does work. You could see if we used y instead of x, the first one would still work. But if we used y instead of x, remember y was the other standard basis vector, 0, 1, then this wouldn't work because it would have the minus 1 here. So you multiply and you get something that was not y. So you can see y isn't invariant, but x is. And so therefore x descends to a vector field on the Klein bottle. It is a Klein bottle vector field, but uh, y doesn't. But uh, I'm sorry, my, my R2 to modulo gamma, but Y doesn't. So we get some some examples of vector fields. Um, we can do other examples. Similarly, we can work out examples on other manifolds. I don't want to do a lot of examples, but um, let's just look at, for example, the torus. Uh, it's almost the same argument, so I won't really give it. The torus, let's say, sometimes called something like TN, is Rn mod Zn. In other words, the real number is quotiented by integer um, uh, shifts. And of course, shifts preserve constant vector fields. So constant vector fields, just like we had this x in our previous example, which was co at constant uh, coefficients. So capital X is some constant 1 dot 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 constant n. Make them just be all be constant functions. That gives you a vector field on Rn. And it's invariant when you shift the vector field because the shift doesn't change the values of the constants and then the derivative of the shift operation is uh, is the identity matrix. So that gives you lots and lots of vector fields and there's some other ones you could also write down on the torus. We said that a vector field was somehow thought of as being like the velocity of a moving fluid. Um, so if we were to sit in that fluid, we could watch little things float in along in it. Um, we'd imagine that if you put a very small uh, particle in there with, with no mass, um, so it doesn't get any momentum, how would it move? It would move along uh, the, f the flow of the, of the fluid. So we need to define what that means to flow, move along the flow of the fluid. So the, um, uh, the flow line um, the flow lines of a vector field X are the uh, solutions of, well, we said we wanted to start at some particular point at, say, time zero. And then that's our little particle floating along. So we said what? Oh, there should be little x. Um, uh, so then we wanted to say, well, that particle should move according to a law. It should be its velocity at each moment should be carried along by the vector field. So the velocity is given exactly by the value of the vector field. Where, though? How do we figure out where to calculate it? Well, we calculate it wherever it is. So it's at position x of t, and at time t, it's at position little x. And we calculate the vector field there, and we make it move according to that. Um, so that's the definition of a flow line. And um, are there any? Um, so the theorem that we want to state is due to Picard, and is known as the existence and uniqueness theorem. And it is that um, there exists a unique flow line with maximal, maximal uh, 
a connected domain. This domain should be a maximal connected interval uh, of uh, definition, domain of definition, uh, uh, so T, um, uh, through each point. And of course, it'll be smooth, we should say also. Um, our vector field is smooth, so it's going to be a smooth flow line. Now, this um, may be something you recognize if you think about the theory of ordinary differential equations. Consider not an abstract manifold, but consider doing this in Euclidean space, in an open set in Euclidean space. What you have is an initial condition, and you have a differential equation. And you know that differential equation with initial condition, as long terms that satisfy certain conditions, is going to be uh, subject to this Picard existence and uniqueness theorem that there is, in fact, some solution. And that's exactly what we're stating here. But we're stating it on manifolds. So it's not the proof is, as it turns out, exactly the same. You prove the result in the chart. The, that's proof using the, the standard existence uniqueness theorem from your ordinary differential equations class. But then you have to pr prove that if you patch together, you get one chart patching together to another and produce another, another solution. The solution's patched together, which is not difficult because, after all, that's how we define how the patching works. We define it in terms of, of making sure that velocity is matched up of moving curves. So we wouldn't have to worry about that. That seems pretty much clear. Um, it's just a lot of notation to fill in a complete proof, so I won't give it. I should point out, though, that there are vector fields that uh, don't have uh, these flow lines defined for all time. It's possible that a solution of an ordinary differential equation can break down. It can go off sort of to infinity and finite time, so to speak and uh, leave you to, to think about examples where you don't have global existence, but only local existence. On the other hand, you do know uh, something better than the Picard theorem. You know that there's also a continuous dependence. So this is the existence uniqueness theorem part of it, but there's also a continuous dependence on initial conditions. A continuous dependence theorem says something like this. Um, it's also due to Picard. Um, uh, so given the vector field pneumatics on a manifold, there exists a unique uh, smooth uh, flow map, smooth map. Uh, so I'll write capital Phi for flow. Um, it's defined on some open set in uh, real numbers cross M, and it should be defined as a map to M. Um, so it's not defined everywhere, but it's defined on some values of time and space, mapping to space, so to speak. Um, it's called the flow. The flow. Um, so that uh, uh, if we write, it's convenient to have the notation that's a little bit nicer than writing it as phi of tx. If we write phi t, let's say phi tp, p is a point, um, uh, to mean phi of t and p. Um, so using this uh, subscript notation for the for the time parameter, um, then um, for each for each uh, fixed p, uh, t goes to v t p is a flow line. Is well is the flow line um, of x. Okay, so for each vector field, there is a flow line. I should say, uh, for all x uh, vector fields on manifold, there is some uh, sm there exists a unique smooth map, which is the flow of of the flow of the vector field x, uh, so that if we write the the, the 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 time variable down here, then we get this that this guy is just a flow line, and um, that's how we we'll want to write it. Now, I, again, I'm not going to give a proof of this result, which is after all the uh, continuous dependence part of the of the existence and uniqueness theorem for differential equations. Again, uh, in in a chart, this is an immediate consequence of that theorem from from your ordinary differential equations class. And um, and then to get it globally on manifolds, you have to patch together. But it's not very global because it's only defined on some open set. Um, however, it has to be uh, defined in such a way that we get the whole flow line. So it is a bit tricky, but it's not enormously difficult to patch together. Uh, so I, it's mostly just a question of complicated notation of all the patching of all the open sets. So I'm going to avoid it as well. I'm going to use it, but I'm not going to not going to prove it. Let's just think a little bit about some of the properties of that flow map. That uh, that, are, that are immediately obvious from the from the notion of what it represents that it produces this this fluid flow. Um, one of them is that uh, phi zero p is p. In other words, if you start at p at time zero and then you flow along for no time at all, you haven't got anywhere. You're still at p. Um, and uh, another one is of course that um, 
if you have a flow line and you ask how fast is it going, well, it's going according to the it's flowing according to the vector field, and that was after all the definition equation for flow lines that it had to satisfy. Well, they had to satisfy these two properties um, to be a flow line, and then the other property, which also comes from the properties of flow lines, is that if you flow for some time t two after flowing for some time t one through some point then it's the same as flowing for first time t1 and then time t2 added together uh, through that point, a trivial observation. And uh, and also, of course, where one side, where this side is defined and this side is defined, and they're equal. Um, and also uh, that uh, if q is phi t, p is defined, then uh, p is phi minus t. Q. You have to think about the fact that the flows are defined not just for positive time, but also for negative time. So if you can flow forward, you can flow backward and get back to where you started from. It's always reversible. Now that we have the concept of a vector field and a flow, what we want to do is to make use of them. And one of the more spectacular results, at least to me, it's so very surprising that such a strong result is true. It's called the flow box theorem. It says that um, if you have a vector field, so x is a vector field uh, on a manifold M, and M naught is a point of M, and x is not zero there, uh, then only need this, uh, then. And again, I should point out that all of our manifolds are smooth, all of our vector fields are smooth, everything's smooth in the whole course, so from here on in, we won't worry about how smooth the vector field is always smooth. But if it's non-zero, then in fact, there is a chart. There's a chart near m naught, a chart whose domain includes that m naught, in which uh, x becomes represented in the chart, its tangent vector representative is x of little x is the rather stupid vector field that just has a single one and a whole bunch of zeros. Um, that's really surprising because it tells us, in particular, I can easily calculate what's the solution of the of the flow for this. I can calculate the flow completely for that. So it seems to say that there's nothing very interesting going on about vector fields. They're almost uh, completely trivial, but it's only it holds at points where the vector field's non-zero. At points where the vector field is zero, the story is much, much more complicated. Still, it tells us that away from the zeros of the vector fields, which typically aren't very, very commonly encountered, there's usually a discrete set of zeros of a vector field um, in most of the examples you run across, the, the theory is almost topological in that there's really no local stru structure going on. There's no local analysis of vector fields. This is the only result of local analysis of vector fields in some sense at least away from the away from their zero where they're zero. But let's give a proof of this. Um, we're working at near some point and we only have to prove there's a chart near that point. So without loss of generality, M can actually be taken to be take any chart around M naught and identify X with a vector field. And we can assume it is in fact an open set in Euclidean space. We don't need to do a global manifold version of this because it's only saying that there is some local chart. Well, if there's some local diffeomorphism of this open set in Rn to something then uh, that, that straightens out this vector field and turns it into that, then, then that's a good enough. So we can always assume that it's just a little open set to replace the manifold by an open set of itself and then by its image under some, some chart. So we can work entirely in Euclidean space and it's not quite so scary. Um, so the other thing we can do, of course, is we can always translate uh, now we have an open set. The point m naught, where the vector field is non-zero, we can get, uh, without loss of generality, we can get that to be the origin. So we've replaced m with some open set in Rn corresponding to some, some choice of chart around m naught, and then we've replaced m naught by translating it to be 0. And let's just rotate um, uh, the, the, the variables to get x uh, uh, at 0 to have so x is 0, it's a non-zero vector. We said by definition x at m naught is not 0. We arranged m naught is 0, so that's x of m naught's non-zero vector. We can arrange that it has its first entry uh, non-zero. Because one of its entries is non-zero, you just have to rotate around until you turn it so that it points, so that it's going toward the, in the direction of the x1 axis, for example. Um, so let's let h um, 
be the hyperplane which in which the first variable is zero. Um, so that's the span of all the other uh, standard basis vectors other than the first one. It's the set of x of the form zero and then any other coordinates. Uh, the set of things that look like that. So that's our hyperplane. So what we now have is a picture. We have a hyperplane and then we have a at the origin we have this capital X coming out of it. It goes in different directions in different places, but we know it's not tangent to that hyperplane. It passes through the hyperplane. It's, it's flows going through the hyperplane because the hyperplane is when x1 is 0, and we know capital X1 is not 0. Okay, so that's the picture that it's passing through the hyperplane H, pushing a little particle through it. Now we want to um, try to set up um, some kind of flow some or some kind of chart that will make it be um, in is, is very simple standard form. Let's let uh, E1, E2, dot, 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 EN be the standard basis vectors uh, of Euclidean space. R, oh, sorry, RN. Uh, can't quite see that. Uh, standard basis vectors of RN. And then what we're going to do, uh, of course, is uh, to replace E1 for the moment with x of 0 and E2 to En. These are linearly independent um, because this guy has a non-zero E1 uh, component. Let's let capital Phi be f the flow of, of this x, this capital X guy. It's not defined everywhere, just in some open set. Um, so now we can say that we take, um, we're going to um, take the points of, let's see, remember what h consists of the vectors of the form x with a 0 in the first entry. And um, now we're going to define a map. Um, a map. This will be our change of chart, or more or less, this will basically be the chart that takes us from one set of variables to another. So let's let it take, let's make new variables and call them s. I don't know why s, but anyway, s1 to sn. And um, the, the, the chart is simply going to map them by taking phi at uh, the flow of the flow of the vector field x for time s1 starting at the point with coordinates 0, s2 to sn. So this takes a point of our hyperplane, that's our hyperplane, takes the point of hyperplane with these variables, I don't know why they're s's instead of x's, but they are, so it takes that point and flows it for time s1 along x. Okay, now let's calculate the, the derivative of this map if we can. Um, so how do we do that? We differentiate the map. Oh, let's do it first of all. I don't, I don't want to do it everywhere. I want to do it only at s equals 0 at the origin of the coordinates. Let's do it there. Then we get d phi ds1 is, if you calculate the derivative of this guy by the definition of a flow, it, the rate at which it moves things is according to the vector field x itself. It's the flow of vector field x, and so it moves it by capital X. Um, and then uh, d phi, uh, that's at 0, d phi d s2 is, well, you'd set s1 to 0 and differentiate these guys, and you get e2 dot 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 d phi dxn is en. So I now calculated out what the derivatives of this phi are. And as a consequence, we can say the matrix of first derivatives of phi, um, d phi ds, or if you like, uh, phi prime of s, uh, phi prime, and we'll do it only at zero, is exactly the matrix with a column x e2 to en. And that has non-zero determinant. That's invertible, an invertible matrix, because we said these are linearly dependent vectors. It's an invertible matrix. So, um, so phi is a diffeomorphism on some open set near the origin. And without loss of generality, it can just be globally a diffeomorphism. Obviously, because we have, we're only working in some open set, we can make it smaller if we need, so that it becomes an actual diffeomorphism. OK, so now what we've got is this diffeomorphism. And now what does it do? Well, the flow of the vector field E1 is, um, let's say, let's call it flow of E1 um, at time t at point, um, well, let's so we get coordinates s1 to sn, is just s1 plus t, s2 to sn. Okay, so uh, the flow of the standard first standard basis vector is to move the component of the first standard basis vector. Um, the flow of x, we don't know what it does, something horrible. But what we can say now 
is that um, uh, so if we do phi of flow time t of the standard basis vector at a point s, um, we get phi of this guy, s1 plus t s2 dot 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 sn. And I can calculate what that is because I know the definition of this phi. The definition of phi is that it's capital phi of x. Now I'm using a better notation. Maybe this capital phi isn't the isn't just the flow. It's the flow of the vector field x. That was the definition of little phi. Flow x for this time, s1 plus t, evaluated at point with the remaining coordinates, the first coordinate set to 0 and the remaining coordinates. So that's this guy. And I can calculate that as uh, by, the diff by the flow properties that we said, that's flowing along the flow of x for time t, flowing along the flow of x for time s1, uh, 0, s2, to sn. And this whole mess here is just little phi. So this is phi t x of little phi of s. So what do these equations say? They say that phi takes the flow v1 and turns it into the flow of x. Phi intertwines flow of E1 before you do phi with flow of X after you do phi. And so you can differentiate that and immediately calculate out that uh, as a consequence of that equation, you can immediately calculate out that phi uh, takes E1 to X. And so phi is a change of variables that takes E1 uh, constant vector field always going in the E1 direction to uh, whatever X is, uh, no matter how complicated the X might be x e1 and so we can we can use that as a as a as a chart we can use what the inverse of that phi as a chart to identify this guy with that guy continuing in our on our perverse uh, discussion of notation it's getting more and more strange um, I remember one of my fellow students when I was studying this subject said he would never study differential geometry because the notation was too horrible um, so further a notation um, which is helpful, um, we take a, a vector field and we can work it out in a chart or we can just imagine it is defined, say, on an open set in Rn, on an open set in Rn, if you like, or it could be on a from, coming from a manifold and we've calculated it in a chart. Um, so we've got this flow. Um, this is its flow. Now let's define an expression. If I write Let's let f be a function, uh, another scalar valued function, number valued function on the manifold. So, um, so then I'll write xf. So f is somehow a real valued function on our manifold. I'm going to write xf to mean how fast f changes as we flow along x. And that'll be at some point. Uh, whoops, I've got too many parentheses. Um, so, uh, and this will be at some point. Again, we're only working in Euclidean space, so that would be fine. Actually, this, this same expression makes sense on a manifold. I could have, yeah, so, so it doesn't really need to be an open set. It could have been a manifold. A little x here could be a point of a manifold. We could say p or m, if you like. Um, so it'd be perfectly fine to do it on a manifold. So let's, let's use that as a definition. But if we do it, now I want to go back to doing it on an open set in Rn, um, because although the definition makes sense on a manifold, and we will use it there um, on an abstract manifold, little p, little p as point in manifold, um, then uh, suppose we do it in the special case where we're actually working on an open set in, in Rn, or we're working in a chart, then we know that our x in that chart is expressible as some column of numbers. It's just an ordinary vector in Rn in the usual sense. It's not very exciting. Um, and then we can calculate this thing by the chain rule. We can calculate out xf at the point x. Again, we're now working entirely in Euclidean space, and we can forget about abstract manifolds. Just think about what this is uh, when you have a vector field in Euclidean space and you have a function in Euclidean space. Uh, we've defined it to be uh, the rate at which f increases along the flow. So we just calculate that out using the chain rule. Um, now we're doing things in Euclidean space, so we can differentiate using ordinary calculus. We're not so scared about the strange, uh, strange objects that arise in manifolds. We can just differentiate this, and we get derivatives of f with regard to variables times derivative of this at time 0. 
uh, and then it should be, of course, the uh, component of it in the i direction of the i x i variable. And so uh, we get, and there's an understood sum. You note this is an Einstein summation convention. We're using Einstein summation because we've got a lower index and an upper index. And so it's the sum over all the variables, the partial derivative of x times the derivative of the of the x i variable. So it's d f d x i times, well, we know how to calculate the derivative of this because it's just capital X, and then we calculate the i -th component of capital X. Okay, so that using Einstein's uh, notation, uh, that's our expression for what xf is. Okay, so we now, it's maybe more convenient to write it slightly differently, only very slightly differently, as uh, in any chart, xf becomes, uh, uh, becomes xi of x df, uh, dxi. Be I have to be a bit careful to make sure that I put my of x here, because this may be on an abstract manifold, but it will correspond in any chart to this thing. I've just worked that out. That's how it looks in any chart. Um, that makes me brave enough, If well, if I were Einstein, I'd be brave enough anyway, to drop the f's on both sides, to say, okay, well, what does it look like if I take the letter f off? What I seem to end up is an equation which can't literally be true. I'll put quotes around the equal sign, because it's obviously not really true that these functions and these derivative operators should somehow, this should be equal to this. It doesn't literally make sense because, um, after all, this is a vector field on an abstract manifold. In the chart, it can be identified with a column of numbers, right? It is literally true that in the chart, x of x, not of x of m, but x of x in, in the chart is this guy. So this is literally true. This is not literally true, but it's a convenient way to think. It's a convenient notation. Um, so again, there's an Einstein convention. I should point out once again, there's this Einstein convention here, here. Those are all Einstein convention. And so that'll be our notation. That's again Einstein notation, is we'll write every vector field like this. Um, so these mean the standard basis vectors, d, d, x, 1, is 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 supposed to be identified with the standard basis vector, which we've usually been calling e1, um, in the chart, in in the x variable, the little x variables. In little x variables, this uh, represents some vector field. What do I mean by represents? Well, I'll take any vector field, which if you wrote it out as a column of numbers would look like this, and I'll write it symbolically by writing it as a sum of its components times this derivative operator in this variable. And that gives us a formal description of it, which is a bit strange, but it allows us to think of the vector field as if it was a differential operator. And one can prove that every differential operator of first order with no zero order terms, every one that looks like this, arises from a unique vector field. So it does actually give us a, a, the ability to think of a vector field as if it really was a differential operator. From now on, I'll cut the quotation marks out of the notation and say that means that, this means this. Um, so from now on, that's how we'll write it. This gives us a, an amazing ability to calculate a change of variables formula because now on, from now on, capital X on my manifold is going to be said to be equal to, this is the, somehow on the manifold, capital X. Um, but I'm going to say it's equal, well, in any chart, it's equal to XI of X uh, D, D, XI. It doesn't literally, it shouldn't be literally equal, it should be quotation mark equal, but it's going to be written as equal because what I mean by this is the vector field which in the in the coordinates, little x coordinates, has these entries. Um, so that's that, what that means. And it gives us a change of variables formula which says that uh, if you use x variables and compute using these capital X's, and I use Y variables, I'm computing, these are different functions, remember, they're not, they're not the same functions as those functions. My functions and my variables still called capital X I, and yours and your variables, they have the same name, but they're not the same functions. They're related by a complicated relationship. And we can actually work out what they are, um, uh, because I know how this, how this is supposed to go. I know that these guys should be related by the, to these guys, by the matrix of, um, by the derivative of the transition map. Remember, it was this y prime of x matrix we had to multiply by to get from one bunch of vectors to the other. And if I write that out here, I get that xi of y must be dyi dxj xj of x. All of this is with Einstein's summation put in place. 
uh, dyi. And so, uh, so this is how these are related. And it actually looks, let's write it slightly, slightly, slightly differently. Let's put that on the other side of that. Put the, the we'll move this matrix in and this out here. And we'll just write it as xj of x dyi dxj d d y i and what it looks like is a cancellation it's just like we were used to seeing in first uh, first year calculus where you seem to have a cancellation when we change variables it seems almost as if the d y i's cancel out and if you knock them allow them to knock each other out here you seem to find exactly what you started with x i of little x d d x i is x j of little x but dxj doesn't matter whether you sum over i's or j's, whatever you sum, sum a dummy summation variable, and then these seem to knock each other out. So it does give you an easy change of variables form, at least somewhat easier to remember. You sort of change variables by introducing uh, these guys that you want you want to express your vector in terms of, but putting them in numerator and denominator. So it's not that strange a change of variables form. It's maybe a bit a bit nicer, and that's one of the motivations for using this notation. That's all we'll do for this chapter. Um, although there are some nice examples in the in the, the lecture notes, they, they compute out for you some examples of vector fields and show you how to calculate uh, with how to calculate flows of some examples. Um, but uh, next time we'll move on to worrying about what if you have more than one vector field when you have one vector field that wants you to go this way and somebody else has a vector field that wants to go maybe like this. Uh, we could try switching back and forth rapidly between doing the one and doing the other, doing the one and doing the other, and see what happens. We want to see how, in some sense, how vector fields interact with one another to create a theory that doesn't just have about, talk about one vector field, but that talks about collections of vector fields that are, in some sense, interacting.